Good afternoon, everyone. I apologize for the fact that there's no coffee this afternoon. The power is out in the kitchen and dining room, but we are working on it, and as soon as it's back on, there will be new coffee. If you were not able to meet with Renee Zuckerbrot or go to Mon Eagle this afternoon because you are in workshop, never fear. We will repeat both of those things tomorrow. Renee Zuckerbrot's meetings are posted on the wall back there. Please do check the sheet and see if you have a meeting with her. The Mon Eagle run will leave at 1.15 tomorrow from the front of the inn. Tonight, we will have the graveyard walk following the 8.15 reading. You'll leave straight from here. You may also join the poker game after the graveyard walk. If you're interested in playing poker and not walking the graveyard, I guess the best thing to do is go to the lodge where the poker game will happen, which is on the corner of Georgia and Mississippi down by our dorms, and wait for them to arrive. They'll be in the graveyard directly across the street so you can watch the torches walk out and back in, in and back out. A reminder that the address lists are out at the end. Please check to make sure that your address is correct. If it is, please initial. If it's not, please correct it. Also, the lost and found is on that same mail table. If you find anything that doesn't belong to you, please leave it there, and hopefully the owner will find it. Mary Flynn forgot to mention that any conferee who would like to submit to Blackbird can submit out of cycle. So on the submission software, just make a note that says, I attended the conference this summer, and she would be happy to read your poetry. And now, please welcome. Whoa! What do you do if your address is different today? I mean, I don't think this is a bad thing. Is <laughs> if your address isn't there and you would like for it to be there, please write it in. If your address is there and you would like for it not to be there, please cross it out. Will that work? All right. Steve wants everybody to write him a letter. <laughs> Please welcome Adrian Heron. Look at all you. You are all such um, beautiful people to me. Um, I, I want to thank Wyatt. Sorry, Wyatt. I have to thank you again and again, um, and Barbara, and Adam, and Megan, and all these uh, people on the, on the staff, these incredibly talented writers. It's like an alternate universe where these talented people serve me drinks. Um, <laughs> and, and all of you, um, and the Sewanee community, all my School of Letters people here, too, um, and especially my, our workshop. Um, it, it is such a deep pleasure to spend time with you and your work. Um, I've just really thoroughly enjoyed it, and really a special thanks to the brilliant and generous Alan Wire. It's just been great to work with you. Um, oh, and, and another special thanks to Johanna Keller and uh, Christina Scott, who really have tried to keep me from making a fool out of myself, so you can put a little blame there where it doesn't work. Um, Pretty much everything I write turns to creep, um, some to the dark side. So what I'd like to do today is, um, is read what started out as a love story for me. And it's a story that's been, it's an excerpt of a story and it's also been abridged, so I hope it, I hope it works. Um, one little thing about this story, it was published in a magazine and then a few weeks later, I got a call from a woman at the Library of Congress. I don't know if you know about this thing, Choice Magazine Listening, if you've ever heard of it, but what they, they put out a quarterly uh, with, with uh, they cull articles and stories from magazines like The Atlantic or Harper's or, or Literary Magazines, and it's for the blind. It's an audio magazine. Um, and it gave me pause for a minute. I'm always happy when somebody wants anything of mine, but um, I wondered what made that particular story uh, attractive for a blind audience. And so I, I started uh, second guessing it. Um, and then I took it as a huge compliment. Um, so I, I thought I would just tell you that and offer for you it here in the nap time slot. If you'd like to close your eyes, <laughs> I will not take it as a judgment. I will take it as a compliment. Um, so don't worry about that. I won't be looking at you and remembering that you, that you don't like me. Um, to, to set the story up a little bit, um, it's about a young couple named Jimmy and Janice. 
uh, who ha both have jobs and have been working but cannot uh, save enough for first, last, and deposit, and they've been living in a campground, basically homeless, nearly desperate as winter's coming on, when uh, Jimmy's boss, Odd Norman, tells him about a farmhouse that very tentatively that might be available for a nominal sum. Jimmy races to get this farmhouse, and I'm gonna pick up the story when he's bringing, he's already been there with the farmer, um, to when he first goes there with Janice, when they first come there. I hope it works. The driveway seemed even longer to Jim, this time to Jimmy. The lacy weeds higher, the neglected fields, a lonesome waving in the fading light. Although nearly dusk, they could see the farmhouse from a distance as they approached. Jimmy pointed out the silhouette of the orchard on the hill, the copse of ash and beech trees behind the house, the slanting timbered barn and the ruined stone foundation of another barn, the farmer said, had burned down a long time ago when God was a teenager. Jimmy had a single key, the long skeleton kind that you had to rattle in the lock before it connected. Oh, Jimmy, Janice said as they toured the house. Oh, Jimmy. He felt for the first time in a long time as if he had a purpose on earth. Like children in a fairy tale, they crept from room to room, pulling dusty sheets from over the furniture, choosing a place to sleep. Four bedrooms in all, four. Two had single beds. The children's rooms, Janice said authoritatively. For the first time in weeks, they made love without anxiety or inhibition. They held nothing back. The old bed creaked from this unfamiliar assault, but held steady. Afterwards, the world fell away, and neither one listened for the rustling sound of animal footsteps, nor wrestled with needs that could not be met. In the morning, frost on the fields outside, they could feel it even as they lay in bed, an altered light, a blue-tinged chill. Jimmy was the first one up, the first one to climb down the stairs into the living room, brilliant with the dusty white sheets piled beside the red velvet couch. He was the first into the cold, sunlit kitchen, the first to see the old refrigerator, a humped-backed ivory kelvinator lying on the floor, its door hanging open and loose, one twisted hinge nearly broken. And more, on the yellow-flowered wallpaper behind the kitchen table, a pretty piece of paper Janice had commented upon the previous night. On this admirable wallpaper, now a red stain, a jellied clump with painfully bright red rivulets running down into the pale yellow wainscoting. He would have cleaned it up right then, quickly before Janice could see, and write the refrigerator too, pretend none of this had happened, but the sponge they'd brought with them from the campground had been torn into pieces, yellow fluff scattered on the brown brick linoleum. And the refrigerator proved far too heavy for Jimmy to lift alone. And here was Janice in the doorway behind him, dressed in an unfamiliar red plaid robe, one hand holding her throat. Who did this, she said in a whisper. She went to the back door, then the front, all the locks still in place, bolts drawn on the inside. Check the window, she said. Go to the basement. He didn't want to, not the basement. Together they put the lights on and walked hand in hand, corner to corner, every window tight, even in the basement. Everything was latched, even painted shut. Dusty rows of preserves still neat on their sway-backed wood shelves. Back in the kitchen, Janice peered at the mess on the wall. Jelly, she guessed. Looking closer, yes, raspberry, but not a broken jar in sight, not a single piece of glass. We didn't hear a thing, Jimmy said, and that, he pointed to the refrigerator, must have been incredibly loud. The walls should have shaken. Janice's face grew hard, thinking of the campground, the frost, winter on its way. I'm not leaving, she announced. She filled the kettle and lit the stove, pulled plates and cups and saucers from the cupboard, washed them in hot soapy water and dried them, dried them with one of their camp towels. Together, groaning, they lifted the refrigerator back in place and plugged it in. We have time for pancakes, she said, digging into their camp cooler. I'll start them, you get dressed. He was uncomfortable now, climbing into the shadowed upstairs, even though he knew no one was there. No one could have been in the kitchen either, but someone had been. He hurried, the air suddenly cooler, and tried not to feel as if he were being watched. When Jimmy came down again, this time clean-shaven, wearing the heavy navy work shirt and tan khakis his word work at Wrangles required, Janice had the coffee poured and was just lifting a pancake onto one of the blue and white farmhouse plates. 
She'd scrubbed the jam off the wall with a faded kitchen towel. Later, he washed dishes while Janice dressed. Most of the yard beyond the kitchen window was overgrown with tall grasses and littered with elongated yellow leaves from a sycamore and tiny brown ones from the yard's other tree, an ancient pear. A few scabby fruits still clung to the highest branches. He observed other things he'd missed during that, his first visit with the farmer a clothesline dangling from two metal poles, a rusted half of an oil drum lying on its side in what might have once been a garden bed. In the remains of several dahlia plants, black with rot, a broken-handled shovel jammed into the earth. You ready, Janice called. He found her in the front hallway already wearing her coat and carrying the dirty canvas bag they used for laundry. It wasn't until they'd parked the car and were walking into the employee lounge at Wrangell's that Janice unbuttoned her peacoat and Jimmy noticed what she was wearing. A thin flowered blouse with a careful ruffle down the front, shades of red and brown that complemented Janice's hair and deep brown eyes. You like it? she asked as she pulled on her red and navy Wrangell's smock. I found it in a drawer wrapped in tissue. Her voice was stronger than he'd heard it in days, more assured. He just nodded. When he paused outside the restrooms to say goodbye, she kissed him on the mouth, an open, lingering kiss that made him pull her hard to him. She had to push him away to leave the hallway before a supervisor walked by. Tonight, she said, at home. That night, they splurged on greasy cheesesteaks in a tavern beside the laundromat. Janice drank two glasses of wine, Jimmy a half pitcher of beer. By the time they reached the turnoff for the farmhouse, the tenderness of the night had overtaken them. They leaned against each other all the way up the drive. Jimmy hadn't remembered leaving the porch light on, but it was a welcome surprise. The open door was not. Once again, side by side, they canvassed the house, checking under each bed, in the back of each closet. They rattled the windows, double-checked the locks, and in the end decided they had not shut the door properly that morning. The next morning, the kitchen was untouched. Nothing seemed out of place. Janice preened as she cooked bacon, toasted bread. Jimmy simply felt relief. Once again, he washed dishes while she dressed. And idly, his eyes swept over the yard. He began making plans. In the spring, they could have a garden. He remembered the shovel, its broken handle, and looked to the corner where it had been so firmly lodged, but the shovel was no longer there. Each evening now they sped home, grocery bags in hand. They no longer had to save every penny for the deposits and rent. Janice brought a crock pot and made beef stew from scratch. She put down a tablecloth, lit thick white candles she found in a utility closet. After supper, they cleaned one room at a time, scrubbing walls and floors. Just like that first morning, Janice gave the orders. Jimmy hadn't known this side of her before and he marveled at the assured manner in which she claimed the house. While they worked inside, the outside seemed to shape up as well. Despite the increasingly dismal mornings, the grayness lifting more reluctantly every day, Jimmy couldn't help but notice how leaves disappeared, how the clothesline was straightened, and the metal drum upended and tucked beneath the eaves of the shed. The ground where the shovel had been was cleared and holes dug as if someone had been stopped in the middle of planting bulbs, a task Janice planned to take on once her day off arrived. One morning he saw a figure moving around the ruins of the barn. A woman. He could tell that much. She turned to face him, and he caught the briefest glimpse of a pale face. By the time he thrust his feet into his boots and opened the back door, she was gone. Although he stalked the grass, nearly all the way up to the woods looking for her, she'd utterly vanished. He didn't mention any of this of Janice, afraid to disturb her new joy, but he brought a new lock home from work and replaced the old skeleton key with standard ones he cut himself at Wrangell's. Janice laughed at him, calling him house proud, and that was fine with him, as long as she was happy. On the night before their first day off, it hailed so hard all the windows shook. Janice, waking, must have thought for a moment they were back in the campground. Oh my God, she said aloud, her eyes still pinched shut. She almost cried when she opened them and began to make out the solid, dry contours of the room. Oh my God, she whispered again, this time in gratitude. Safe, they must have had the thought at the same time, warm under the covers, burrowing close to one another, when they heard the front door open, the squeak of its hinges like a single high-pitched whistle. They waited for footsteps, 
And when those didn't come, both Janice and Jimmy jumped out of bed and began hurriedly dressing. The woman Jimmy had seen by the barn ruins was seated in the living room on the red velvet couch. She had nothing with her, not a purse or a suitcase. Her red knuckled hands, noticeably big and broad for a woman, were empty, loosely clasped in front of her. A woman in her early 40s, perhaps, with brown hair going to gray, cut in a peculiar style, clipped severely in front, left much longer in the back. She wore a pair of plain navy blue tra polyester trousers, a pink cotton blouse, and a long gray cardigan that might once have belonged to a man, all but cleaned and pressed and dry. She did not smile at Janice or Jimmy, nor did she seem surprised to see them. Her eyes were flat, her skin pale and chapped, her lips one rigid line. You're finally up, she said. It's time we met. She said her name was Peabody, Marion Peabody the farmer's wife. Jimmy was glad Janice was in her own jeans and turtleneck for a change. He began to introduce himself and Janice, but Janice interrupted. You can't just walk in here, you know, she said, tilting her chin. We pay rent. Marion Peabody shrugged her off. A tiny, inadequate sum, I'm sure. He didn't ask for more. He, and here the woman's voice resembled a heel grinding hard at the earth, he has no rights here anymore. It's his house, he says. She looked as if she would spit at Janice. Instead, the words ratcheted out. She had been away. Despite her absence, this was still her house. No one could take that from her. We're not leaving, Janice said. Get used to that, Mrs. Peabody. We're paid up, and we're not going anywhere. Jimmy tried to find the farmer's telephone number, but the slip on which Odd Norman had written it had long been lost, and the phone company had no listing for the name Jimmy had written on the check. He drove to the mailbox where he met the farmer that first time, turned up the rutted gravel drive, and drove almost a quarter mile into a logged hillside until the driveway ended at a turquoise mobile home. Every shade was drawn, but he could hear a television or radio playing as he knocked, and the farmer promptly answered, looking wary. So she's come to you, has she? Like I said, you keep me out of this. You want to pay me less rent, you go ahead. I'm not coming to collect. I'd as soon see the place disappear than fight for it with her. Been away? Is that what she tells you? She says the farm is hers? Ask her who's still paying the tax on it. Ask her no better yet. Clear out while you can. Clear out. We just moved in. Word to the wise, he told Jimmy with a mean smile. Get yourself a big old dog. She hates him. You get a good, fierce one, he'll chase her right into the night, and you can just lock up tight behind her, listen to the wind come up, and know it's only taking her farther away like a little bit of trash dumped on the property line. Jimmy was beyond despair. He couldn't imagine where they'd go. There was a shelter in Roslyn, the next town over. Janice would die. No, they'd sell the car first, get new jobs, walk to work. His chest contracted. He could hardly get a breath. Oh, baby, he whispered, oh, Janice, baby, I am so sorry. But when he arrived back at the farmhouse, Janice didn't even grill him about the farmer's response. She and Mrs. Peabody were in the kitchen drinking coffee from pink flowered cups. Marion's going to stay, she told Jimmy. <laughs> and we are too. Later, as they drove to town alone, she told him that Marion had no place else to go. If she couldn't stay there, she'd have to sleep in the fields. She'd be homeless, Jimmy Janice declared. Her family wouldn't talk to her. No one around here would give her a job. Her husband, the farmer, never sent her a dime. She had nothing, nothing to live on. But of course, she owned a house, their house. At first, sharing was not a hardship. And on the surface, their lives went on normally. Jimmy and Janice, Janice rattled down the driveway in the bluish haze of morning and returned to a dim yellow light in an upstairs window. Marion had claimed one of the front bedrooms, and the door was always locked, and Janice checked, locked. I mean, shut, and all, Janice checked, locked. Sometimes as they entered the house, they heard the indistinct melodies of a transistor radio. Other times, Marion's own voice, an even incantation that went on for hours. Praying, Jimmy guessed. For us to leave, Janice smirked. Fat chance. They picked up items from the drugstore for Marion when she asked. Aspirin, baby powder, a pair of haircutting scissors she used to give herself a new, softer haircut that compelled Jimmy and Janice to reassess her age. She might not be that much older than they were, they reckoned. 
This awareness made them both a little uncomfortable, as if they couldn't trust their own eyes, as if she'd lost years in the brief time she'd spent with them. Occasionally, she requested something from a specialty shop, a bottle of sherry, a ball of rose tweed wool. She didn't seem to possess a single cent. At least she never offered to pay for anything, and Janice, toting up their expenses, suggested to Jimmy they stop paying the farmer altogether, since he had apparently decided to forgo his own responsibility. Jimmy thought she meant they should pay Marion. What, Janice said, are you kidding, when she's living here with us? A whole month went by, then another, rain and sleet, the first whispers of snow, and no one arrived to protest the missing rent. Under the unexpected weight of an ice storm, limbs from the pear tree cracked and fell, and someone, Marion apparently, dragged the branches behind the shed and sawed them into firewood. Marion didn't seem to mind the cold. In fact, her interest clearly lay outside. From the quick kitchen window, Jimmy saw her emerge from the old barn, empty except for a few rusty kid bicycles and a broken wagon. He tracked her from the window as she wandered through the stubbled icy field, wearing her usual outfit topped only by that thin gray sweater. As he spied from the window, Marion gazed intently toward the woods and raised a hand as if she were greeting someone. But when he looked with her, the woods were still and empty, and the sky remained the dull charcoal of a winter dusk, patches of snow sunk into the ditch by the driveway. He could hear Janice in the upstairs hall cranking up the thermostat, and he shivered at the thought of Marion in her ragged sweater. For the first time, he rummaged in the back of the hall closet, emerging with a heavy wool jacket, brown plaid. Coatless himself, he carried the jacket out into the dim field, turning in circles as he looked for Marion, who was right beside him. You'll catch your death, Jimmy said, shocked as much by the chiding tone in his voice as by the delicate feel of the woman's shoulders when he draped the jacket around her by the surprising pure blue of her eyes. Well, hello, Jimmy, she said, as if she just noticed his existence. After that, the brown plaid jacket took up residence on the coat rack on the, by the kitchen door, its absence signaling Marion's as well, and Jimmy found himself continually checking the hooks, then scanning the white fields below the purple sky, sighting her the way another man might look for deer out of season, starved and feeble and ready. She was the easiest of housemates, a mere cipher on the edge of their existence, and yet it wasn't long before a battle began. Every day, a new insult, a fresh intrusion, arrived to irritate Janice. Marion left dishes in the sink. Janice washed a dish if she liked the pattern. Otherwise, she plucked it from the sink and deposited it straight into the garbage. Mouse droppings were discovered in the cupboards. Janice set traps between the saucepans baited with peanut butter. Marion scattered breadcrumbs in their bedroom closet. Jimmy found himself standing inside the open closet door, breathing in the comforting aroma of freshly baked bread. He had to force himself to whisk up the crumbs before Janice discovered them. Then came the cough. Marion developed an insistent, baneful bark that could not be calmed by Janice's offer of tea or lozenges or a good thwack on the back. <laughs> See a doctor, Janice told her. We'll drive you. I'll listen to her, listen to her Janice told him. Could a cough be more fake? There were times when Jimmy longed for a straight haunting like their first night, plates crashing against the walls, furniture moving, all of it unexplained. The reality of Marion worried him far more than any ghost could have. The way she never got angry at Janice, just stared at her blankly like one of those old ladies at the nursing home where his grandmother had served out her last blind, baffled days. The way she stalked the periphery of the old barn ruins, her head bobbing up and down as if she were in conversation. The way her fingers brushed lightly against his own when they passed plates at the table, causing a confusing heat to swirl deep in his belly. And there were other times when he held Janice in his arms and felt the thin blades of Marion's shoulder. When Janice, wearing her pilfered blouse, swept into the Wrangles employee lounge and the fierce, musty scent of Marion filled the air between them. When wool gathering at the kitchen window, he thought he heard the whisper of his name and lumbered toward the back door to find Marion already at the stoop, one reddened hand reaching for the metal doorknob. At those moments, he felt as if he recognized her, and he was glad she was near. Despite Janice's skepticism, he believed in Marion, 
She'd lost weight, revealing a fragility that pierced Jimmy, that made him want to gather her up and tend to her. But when Jimmy grew awkward making love with Marion just down the hall, her coughing, making her present in a way she hadn't been before, Janice grew angry. Don't you let her stop us, she whispered. It's our house, she said to Jimmy in a voice that no longer whispered. We can do whatever the hell we please. Neither of them said a word when moments later doors began slamming all over the house, a grander version of Marion's cough. One evening, when Janice was unexpectedly stuck with an overtime shift, Jimmy drove home alone to pick up their laundry. As usual, the house appeared blank and deserted, save for the light in Marion's window. As he crept along the upstairs hall trying to be quiet, he was surprised to see her bedroom door open. He could hear her struggling to suppress that itchy cough and thought, too, he heard her call to him as he passed. In the dim golden light of her bedside lamp, he could barely make out Marion's figure sitting on the edge of the bed, her back to the door. An overwhelmingly pungent scent caused him to stumble as he crossed the threshold. At the sound, Marion pulled back and the light her body had blocked spilled over her. He could see now that her back and shoulders were bare, she held the edge of the bed sheet against the front of her body. Beside her on the bed was a jar of eucalyptus liniment Janice had bought for her own sore muscles when they were still sleeping in the campground. I, I, I'm sorry, Jimmy stuttered. I, I, I thought you... Come here a moment, Jim, Marion said, keeping her face away from him. There was a spot just below her shoulder blades, but behind her rib cage, she said. She could feel a tightness within her, but couldn't reach it with the liniment. If you wouldn't mind, she said, holding the jar out to him. His weight sagged the mattress and caused Marion to tip in his direction. In the warm, pooled light, her skin was near golden, as grainy and perfect as an old photograph. The cold liniment burned on his fingertips when he rubbed it lightly in the center of her back. Although he'd been dead tired as he drove home from Wrangles, he felt brilliantly awake now, focused on his task. Marion tipped her head forward, exposing the long line of her bare back. He needed a muscled knot, and she groaned softly, a deeply pleasurable human sound that caused that hot egg to swell again within Jimmy. He was about to pull away when Marion suddenly turned to thank him, and his busy hand swept across her breasts. For a second, he was stunned, but she didn't move, not even as Jimmy began, his fingers still slick with the liniment to circle her breasts. By the time she lay back on the bed, his eyes were half closed, but his hands were still moving. Her body rippled, actually rippled, and this thrilled him as if he just made her come alive. Before long, it was Jim crying out. He heard his voice as if it were calling him from another room, agonized, ecstatic. Only when he was flinging his old car down the black country road, racing to reach Wrangles before Janice's shift ended, his entire body still charged with the encounter, did he begin to realize what he'd done. Then Marion's parting words, this is between us, seemed less an absolution, less even a colluding promise than a shadowy everlasting alliance. And indeed, when an exhausted Janice moved into his sleeping arms later that night, he saw that Marion had taken up full residence between them, her solemn blue gaze both urging him on and holding him back. The next day, Janice's shift was once again extended three hours, a wrangle's trick, this temporary shift extension. Until the holidays were over, she'd be on overtime without the extra pay. No big deal. I can get what I can use whatever money I can get, she told Jimmy, who noticed that she said I, not we. Since Marion had moved in and they'd stopped paying rent, they'd banked most of the money they'd been paying Peabody. But Janice was losing her fear of falling off the edge. Marion's abandoned wardrobe, once a boon, didn't thrill her any longer. Jimmy was sorry to see her discard her old clothes from the campground, sorry too when she put away the simple belted house dresses and delicate floral blouses. He'd grown used to them, even found them sexy in a way that the tight sweaters and low-slung jeans Janice now bought from Wrangles never could be. At first, he'd hang around town for a few hours after work, just as he and Janice had done when they were at the campground. But Janice groused at the money he was spending on coffee or food. Why, for instance, should he, should he visit a restaurant when the refrigerator and freezer were both fact, packed from her weekly excursion to Wrangell's new food mart? Janice instructed him in the crockpot's finer points, left him with a fistful of recipe cards, and all but ordered him to stay home each evening. 
Yet it was Marion who began to cook. Blue willow, china platters that had somehow escaped Janice's plundering appeared on the table laden with fried chicken and biscuits, green beans cooked in bacon fat, a meatloaf not unlike his mother's. He ate with abandon, barely suppressing a hum of pleasure that arose without warning. She watched him, hardly touching the food herself. In fact, she'd grown so thin. Now it was Marion who filched Janice's clothes. Afterwards, washing dishes together, his hands would slip again, rubbing against Janice's old blue sweater, unbuttoning jeans as familiar as his own, and before he could catch his breath, they would be back in her golden room. Remember this, Marion commanded, remember this. The truth was, she made him forget. Each night he struggled to wake and push himself down the stairs and back into the car. Twice he was late getting to Wrangles and the parking lot was nearly empty except for the night crew and an idiot stock clerk who clearly had a crush on Janice. Wally, red-headed Wally, Wally the weightlifting gossip who wandered from department to department with his price gun and cart spreading rumors of his own devising. The car wouldn't start, he explained to Janice the last time while Wally smirked in the background. You leave me waiting like that one more time and I might just take that boy up on his offer of a ride, Janice said as she closed the car door. I'll clean the plugs, he promised. You do that, she said. After a pause, hey, I heard something about our Marion today. Jimmy's groin still tingled. His head was full of, of images of Marion, and he was grateful the dark hit his tangled hair, his own swollen lips. Oh, yeah? Her kids aren't farmed out, Janice informed me. Wally told me they're both dead. A car accident. Our Marion was drinking, he said. Three teenagers from Meredith died as well. They were in the other car. That's why she's been away, you see. She must have been in jail. All those dead kids, and that's why she doesn't drive. God, it makes so much sense. She fingered a hand-knitted red scarf she'd taken from a hidden cedar chest in the girls' room, loosening its knot around her throat so that a gash of her own white skin appeared between the folds and glowed in the dark car. Wally, Jimmy spat. Not just Wally, Carol in Housewares told me the same story. Her nephew was in Scouts with Marion's boy. But here's something funny. Wally swears Marion poisoned herself before the trial with arsenic that the farmer kept in the old barn. What an ass. Jimmy's hand shook on the steering wheel. Wally says she smuggled it into her food. He said it took her days to die. Well, he mixed up Peabody's story, didn't he? Obviously, but Wally, mention his name one more time and I'll drive off the road, Jimmy declared. Well, what's wrong with you? That night, for the first time, Jimmy slept downstairs alone, his heart thrumming with the loss Janice had tried to hand him. She revived him. She exhausted him. She brought him to life. She slayed him. At work, he was clumsy, a dumb smile plastered on his face, the kind of smile Janice once said made him look like a cat with buttered whiskers. He drifted off in conversations, licking his butter, the almost physical memory of her touch. Someone's getting some, Donnie from Outdoors Recreation remarked as he passed through hardware and tools and caught Jimmy blissfully open mouth before a rack of plastic elbow pipes. <laughs> Odd Norman overheard and frowned at a, as a, at a grinning Donnie. Faced with a somber, um, who composed himself and moved on. Odd Norman was his supervisor and the closest Jimmy had to a male friend. And normally Jimmy would have shared any news in his life, but the situation with Marion was, was too strange. No one knew they shared a house with her. How could he tell him about his new home life? And yet, like any besotted lover, his whole being sang with the desire to hear her name, to casually throw out, Marion says, Marion told me, Marion, Marion, Marion. But of course he couldn't. He couldn't. Could he? Marion Peabody, you say? Odd Norman glanced at him, the dimpled lines in his handsome long face emphasized by his concern. I knew her as a girl, quiet kid, a real sweetheart, the kind of kid who brought frosted cupcakes to school on other people's birthdays. She deserved better. She would have been the best of wives to the right man, you know, a real homemaker. Jimmy grinned and nodded. He began to explain their situation. Janice, he emphasized it was Janice inviting Marion to live with them. He flushed red, but he couldn't stop himself. He had to share. One night he began, when Janice was at work, 
A customer wandered up the aisle talking, as customers usually did over Odd Norman's head, to Jimmy, who immediately deferred the question to the dwarf, um, the man's question to the dwarf. Odd Norman pursed his lips as he led the man away from Jimmy toward the socket wrenches. Only much later, as Jimmy was clocking out, did Odd Norman catch up to him again, tapping Jimmy on the hip. Not marrying Peabody, Odd Norman told him. Jim, you must be wrong about that. She has such pretty eyes, he told Odd Norman. You'd never guess it. Can I come see her? Sure, Jimmy said. He didn't want Odd Norman at the farmhouse, didn't want him to see Marion. Most of all, he didn't want to lose his evening alone with her. How about Thursday? Thursday was Janice's day off. Tonight, Jim. I'd like to come tonight. Oh, oh sure, Jimmy said, fuming. Any time. They were still at the table when Odd Norman drove up in his ticking Volkswagen, Jimmy savoring a wedge of warm pear pie. She heard Norman long before he did, and by the time the headlights swept across the front porch, she'd fled upstairs. Jimmy could hear the door close, the lock snapping into place. He had to smile. If she wasn't around, Norman wouldn't stay long. But Odd Norman would take, wouldn't take any of Jimmy's excuses. He reached for the banister and mounted the stairs, Jim on his heels, paused in the hallway and called out, Marion, Marion, it, it's, it's Norm Kasky. Are you here, Marion? You remember me, don't you? Honey, I want to talk to you. To Jimmy's great surprise, Marion's door swung open. Odd Norman took a step back. He gazed upwards. A range of expressions crossed his face. Joy, awe, sorrow. Oh, Marion, he said, it is you. From where he stood, Jimmy couldn't see Marion at all. Odd Norman had one of her hands in his own, and because she was so much taller, the little manager appeared to be on his knees, his face upturned, shining. You know you can't stay, don't you, sweetheart? You know this isn't your home anymore. You don't think I deserve this, she said. It's not yours, Norman said. He nodded towards Jimmy. He's not yours. They're gone, Marion. It's over now. A series of crashes began as if every ordinary article Marion had collected during her stay, the Band-Aid tin, a black pot of shoe polish, was being hurled at the walls. You have to go now, Marion. Leave. Hey, Jimmy objected, but no one seemed to hear him. A rhythmic shushing sound began as Norman spoke. Jimmy did not recognize it as weeping until Norman bent to kiss her hand and said goodbye, leading Jimmy down the stairs and out the front door with him. He'd never even removed his jacket or the peaked blue hat he wore. Jim, he began. What the hell do you think you're doing, Norman? Jimmy demanded, but he didn't wait for an answer. He slammed the car door odd Norman held open and stood there, his, arm folded across his, his arms folded across his chest until Norman shook his head and finally started his car. She wasn't in the room when he returned, not in the bathroom, the kitchen, the living room. He searched the house in a fever, calling her name. He thought about calling for his dogs, dogs he didn't own, great black hounds with red-rimmed jaws and wild eyes who would run through the house, a mad gallop that would shake the walls and unfasten the doors from their hinges and chase Marion back into his arms. The brown plaid jacket was missing from the hook, and, and so he raced outside again, coatless himself. Beside the house, the barren woods rustled a brittle rattle that he mistook for her footsteps. He bellowed, but the wind snatched her name the moment it left his mouth. Hours, it seemed, he searched, his hands numb with cold, the old batteries in his flashlight giving way while he's still high up in the ice-lick fields. The wind died down, the night became unbearably still, and he was nearly lost when far away another car door slammed. And Jimmy peered, from the treed hilltop to see tail lights retreating and outlining the long driveway for him. He stumbled toward them, sliding, losing his balance, falling hard again and again until his feet smacked the stones of the barn ruins and his legs felt too weak to move. He could see lamps springing on, Janice claiming the house, each uncurtained window framing her escalating emotions. He tried to wave, to plead for help, but the black night had become her mirror, and he was, he soon realized, caught on the far side of that reflection, and she would be blind to him. Thank you.